Okay, so my talk today is the existential crisis of traditional shopping streets. And I want to start uh, with a story. Uh, so in East London, uh, Poplar High Street stands as a sort of testimony, testimony one might say, to what happens uh, when a traditional high street, a traditional shopping street loses its function. You can see at the top here, historic photos show a busy and diverse street dominated by retail uses at the ground floor level and accommodation, probably pretty poor quality above it. Um, and maps show that over its one kilometer length, there were 10 pubs, bowling green, music hall, public library, vicarage, churches, two schools, council offices, a mortuary and many other things, plus retail, of course, um, small scale manufacturing and service businesses. Now, the area, of course, was, was bombed heavily in the Second World War, but it was really the, the industrial decline of the docks subsequently, um, the, the docklands in London, which led to its demise. And also the rebuilding of large parts of it after the bombing with social housing, much of which turned its back uh, on the streets. So whilst you see a few sort of civic remnants of the past, um, everything that gives it, uh, gives a high street, uh, its sort of dynamism is, has, has largely ceased to be. And, and Poplar High Street, I think, therefore, is a portend of what could happen if we don't address the very different threats to our high streets today. Now, traditional shopping streets often go back centuries, uh, fed by what Bill Hillier uh, christened the movement economy. So as people moved along natural movement corridors, the optimum position uh, of some parcels of land in, in a sort of an, an emerging urban street network allowed the establishment of businesses that relied on those passers-by. And over time, these functions were reinforced and commercial streets emerged with some becoming destinations in their own right, uh, fed by their centrality, many of which we, we, we have christened, in this country at least, high streets. In, in, in the States, they'd be called main streets. Whilst the growth of uh, a car-based sort of urbanization, I suppose, in the 20th century and of the internet in the 21st has arguably progressively challenged this place-based movement economy, um, I think it was the arrival of COVID-19 in, in 2020 that finally broke it. Uh, at least it broke it temporarily. Uh, so in this country, figures from the Office for uh, National Statistics covering the whole of the UK showed that e-commerce grew in a single year from around a fifth of total sales, retail sales, to over a third. And as we all know, society quickly found ways of using technology to sustain us in our homes, to allow us to work from home, as many of us are doing today on this call, to shop from home, to eat out at home. Uh, to entertain ourselves, even get access to public and health services and so forth without ever venturing beyond our doors. So why should we care about all this? Well, we often see high streets as places that uh, are all about the shopping. Yet a characteristic of traditional high streets, like the popular example I started off with, is that they are actually super diverse places. Retail uses are often only part of a total mix, which is spread both vertically up buildings and horizontally into the sort of hinterlands of the urban blocks behind the frontage of the high street. But retail, nevertheless, it remains the sort of public face of many of our high streets, often in the form of active and continuous, continuous frontage. And a move away from physical retail significantly changes that experience of those streets, effectively removing and, in a sense, you could say, privatising previously active frontages. Furthermore, access to good quality shops seems to be particularly important in people's sense of pride and community uh, in the UK, for example, coming first in a recent uh, Demos study, 
uh, about what boosts people's uh, sense of subjective well-being, although it also came first amongst those local place factors considered most in need of improving across the UK. So what seems clear is that the outlook for traditional high streets, um, if, if it's to improve, then we need a new basis for supporting many of those, um, uh, those sorts of uses. So, uh, a new basis that is no longer dependent, or at least not entirely dependent, on movement uh, and centrality. So to understand this, it's uh, necessary, I think, to understand the different reasons people choose to make the shopping choices that they do. And this uh, sun model on the screen here conceptualizes the relative significance of factors for physical versus online shoppers. So the factors uh, colored in yellow strongly inform choices of online shoppers and are the reasons why online has effectively become such a powerful disruptor of traditional shopping habits. Uh, factors in red at the bottom remain influential in helping to retain a physical customer base, although uh, only sort of the immediate and the social elements there are what you might call positive factors. Uh, uh, some people favour high streets because they're, they're, you, don't, you don't have to use technology to, to engage with them, but that, those are usually people who aren't necessarily comfortable or don't have access to technology. So that's not in, in a sense a sort of positive reason for using bricks and mortar. Factors in the middle in orange inform the decisions of all shoppers, but darker orange is likely to be more important to physical shoppers. And cost in lighter orange in the middle is of course always a factor in any purchase decision, but in allowing such extensive shopping around with ease, cost drives consumers to shop online more than it keeps them in bricks and mortar. So examine, examining the model, I think it's clear that no single outlet, as opposed to a retailer, whether online or offline, can offer uh, everything. Uh, indeed, no mode, I think, has a monopoly on, on any of these factors represented in the sum model. Um, but instead, they offer combinations of qualities. At the same time, uh, the, the areas of greatest strength for online outset, uh, outlets, which we could call the four C's, certainty, co uh, convenience, choice and cost, uh, tend to be very direct and tangible and against which traditional retailers struggle to compete. So in this respect, it's no accident that physical retail advantages are reminiscent of a setting sun in the figure, uh, albeit that the challenges faced are, are, are nothing new. So for decades before e-retailing e really took off, discussions focused around the perceived negative impact of out-of-town retailing on traditional high streets. And looking at them physically, these changes can be viewed as part of a journey from mixed, integrated and place-dependent urbanism to more separated, disintegrated and non-place urbanism. So uh, retail boxes setting up, set amongst sort of extensive free car parking on the edge of cities, if you like, offered a stepping off point towards the same four C's that define uh, the online retail experience. So in that case, it was convenience, at least for those with cars, greater choice, given the size of many of these sort of out of town box units, uh, greater certainty given the stock that they can hold and which is on offer and reduced cost given their economies of scale, lower rents, lower overheads and so forth. So arguably all these advantages have been given rocket boosters in the online world where the sun is relentlessly rising. And early evidence from shoppers in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic has tended to demonstrate a preference for car parks and larger, more spacious footplate format and formats of out-of-town retail over the more crowded spaces of town centres, although that, of course, may gradually change over time. Uh, in the long term, it may be, however, exactly the sort of place-based differentiation 
from the online model that traditional shopping streets allow, which in turn will enable them to survive. So the fact that they are more different in type from online retail than out of town may in fact give them an advantage uh, over time. And certainly some of the pre-pandemic evidence suggested that out of town was in decline steeper than traditional high streets. Anyway, this all I think reveals a sort of critical conceptual distinction relating to the scale at which the different factors and associated challenges of physical retailing mean to be addressed. So the image which, uh, which I'm showing here shows factors on the left that are predominantly determined within this sort of individual retail outlets, whether those are singular outlets or chains of outlets, and those on the right that relate to the particular marketplace, you know, whether that's the internet at large or a particular town or city centre. So if we set fiscal taxes and incentives aside, which the Chancellor may very well be dealing with now as regards uh, a retailing, I don't know. Um, it, it's within these sort of place factors on the right that the public sector and also large private retail investors like shopping centre owners can hope, if you like, to influence the future of their particular physical marketplace. Outlet factors, um, by contrast, reflect either the simple realities of, of the channel being used to shop. For example, you can't touch things on the internet, but you can be certain that once you've purchased something with a few clicks of a mouse, then it's going to arrive, or at least they've got it. Um, or alternatively, are factors which are determined by the particular retail model being pursued. Uh, for example, uh, physical retailers can employ polite and helpful assistance to help people to make the right decisions about their retailing choices and so forth. So faced with this, governments, uh, national and local, and I think everywhere internationally, might adopt one of three strategies. And I think the UK, in a sense, is an interesting um, market to look at in this respect, because we're sort of further ahead in this, this move online in terms of retail than many other comparable markets. But I think governments everywhere have, as I say, a number of different choices that they can take. They can take what we might call a Darwinian strategy, letting the, you know, letting the, fit, the fittest survive and just see what happens. And you might argue that historic shopping streets, that's exactly what happened. You know, some things survived and some things died and the government largely left them to their own devices. Or we might adopt a more interventionist strategy, and you know, there's all sorts of ways of doing that, some of which are listed there on the screen. Uh, and that reflects the fact that not all citizens are necessarily equally fit, wealthy, or technologically savvy, and therefore necessarily equally able to deal with whatever the market forces happens to throw up. Um, so, you know, th there's a more, certainly a more interventionist route. And there's perhaps a mixed model. Which, which reflects something of both of the, of the above. And you may argue that in, in England at the moment, for example, we have a, an estimated 25% over provision of retail space. So you might say in that context, you might adopt a pragmatic argument that actually you have something of both of the above, but a bit of Darwinian strategy and a bit of intervention as well. Current policy approaches, and here I'm talking about England, I think Wales, may be very different, and I'll be interested to hear your, your reflections on that. Uh, but in England, um, at different times and in, in, in different ways, government has tended to adopt both the first and second strategies, and sometimes those have been in conflict. So the first strategy, I think, is tended to be reflecting the deregulatory predilections of the English government. Uh, as encapsulated in the increased use of permitted development rights in particular. And so recently, undaunted by the reports of the very poor quality housing accommodation that was being delivered through permitted development rights and, and related liberalizations of the planning system, uh, the government nevertheless introduced a wholesale new liberalization of planning, which was a new mega class, class E, uh, of the uh, permitted development order. 
And this allows, in effect, conversion without planning permission of all commercial business and service uses to residential uses. And there's an example here of the previous fireplace showroom, which is now six one bedroom tiny little flats. Doesn't need planning permission, so there's no control on the quality. And with this major new change that has just been introduced, the worry is that this will extend very quickly across many of our high streets. So in, in introducing this change, the government, as I say, in England, argued that allowing more housing in such locations will diversify uses and help to support retail through having larger populations within walking distance of high streets. A side effect, however, is the removal of almost the only, albeit a rather crude mechanism, short of public sector ownership, for local authorities to direct an appropriate mix of uses on high streets. So a key danger is that deregulation might actually reduce the diversity that it seeks itself to inject as units like the one above, what the former shop, uh, former uh, single shop, are converted to rather crude, uh, not very high quality uh, re uh, residential. And certainly given the choice between the uncertainties of the retail industry in crisis, an office market also in transition, as many of us white collar workers increasingly choose to work from home, the low values associated with small scale manufacturing or community functions, the logical approach for investors to take is to run to residential as soon as they're allowed, leading to this sort of gap tooth type appearance on many affected streets. Intervention as an alternative to deregulation is, of course, far more complex, cutting across the realms of planning, design and curation. In con contrast to um, deregulatory instincts, uh, at least the current deregulatory instincts of, of the UK government, um, with increasing urgency, it is also encouraged a more active approach to the nation's high streets. Moving from a small fund of 1.2 million in 2011 to address the problems on the English high streets, um, to a one billion pound fund in 2019. Uh, a one billion fund for local authorities up in the down, up and down the country to intervene effectively in their local high streets. Now that sounds like a lot, uh, but it's very modest when you compare it to a single shopping centre, the Westfield Shopping Centre in London, which costs 1.7 billion to build. Uh, it's tiny when you compare it to the 23 billion invested in UK operations by Amazon since 2010. So also. Uh, the step change in resourcing has not, uh, unfortunately, been followed by a step change in vision, um, with funding tending to focus on limited, often one-off capital projects, rather than fundamentally rethinking the nature of our high streets, uh, a rethinking called for by many commentators, including Bill Grimsey. Now, Bill Grimsey, argued that every town centre should have a dedicated plan of its own. And in this, the core retail area should be defined and protected, whilst retail in secondary areas should be allowed to shrink through a combination of conversion to the residential uses and active relocation of valued local retailers. So if you like, this is that third strategy. It's a sort of mixed strategy. Uh, more active intervention, but also letting the market itself shrink retail in areas uh, not defined as core. So planned shrinkage can encourage an intensification in the frontage that remains, including by building residential over and behind retail uh, and avoiding the problem of permanent holes appearing in frontages. Such a strategy, of course, relies on regulation alongside more, alongside more proactive planning uh, and public-private uh, uh, partnership and potentially uh, even land and property assembly and development. It would benefit from the already established uh, trend of a growing population living within walking distance of high streets. 
So without actually building new residential on high streets or only very selectively, there is already a growing population near within walking distance of high streets across England. Uh, that population is increasing at double the rate of other locations. Finally, on the design front, Yangel famously distinguished between necessary, optional and social activities. Uh, in the use of public space, reflecting the idea that for people to really engage in places, uh, they need to want to do so because the place is appropriately uh, conducive. So the sun model can be interpreted in a similar way, with the more prosaic factors associated with shopping set against this, a smaller sort of number of enriching factors related to the very human desire to be together and enjoy ourselves. My own pre-pandemic research confirmed a strong association between these enriching means and the quality of streets, quality of high streets. Um, by comparing high streets that had been subject to significant public realm redesign and investment to those that had not, uh, the work identified that improvements to the quality of the street fabric encouraged people to walk more, to stay longer and ultimately boosted the desirability of surrounding retail space and reduced vacancy. And significant UK government funding for uh, emergency design interventions uh, in the country's high street in the wake of the uh, COVID pandemic envisaged similar possibilities. This funding was this time from the um, Department for Transport. And it resulted, and resulting changes have sometimes been temporary like uh, the intervention on the left, slide, uh, the image on the left, sometimes permanent, like that on the right, the right a new um, uh, cycleway, uh, all about building a new era of walking and cycling according to the policy. And all driving things that have a track record, a proven track record of boosting spend in shops. Turning to curation, um, Abrahams commented that in order to survive, the high street will need to find new purpose in becoming the latest arena for customer experience innovation. And this represents a major challenge for, for traditional shopping uh, when the competition, namely internet platforms, shopping malls and even out of town retail parks are highly curated in order to optimize the experience in terms of convenience, the choice on offer and the ability to navigate those choices. So managers of large shopping malls, for example, for example, have long understood the value of mixing retail, entertainment, event spaces and restaurants in order to keep users coming back and to encourage movement in a manner that optimizes spend. The thought of giving up control on the mix and incorporating non-active uses into it, as suggested by the deregulatory PDR changes impacting on English high streets, would be an absolute anathema in those sorts of concept, uh, uh, contexts. Town centre management in various guises and business improvement districts have, of course, developed uh, in an attempt to try and transfer some of this private sector methods and know-how to publicly managed streets. But the reality of fragmented uh, ownerships, limited resources, uh, and a lack of focus in the public sector on the growing threats to, to, to traditional high streets have tended to combine to limit their impact in many places. So while the public sector typically has direct control of only a limited stock of buildings in most town centres, it does have control over many key public services, uh, like this library in East London, with the potential to relocate them back onto high streets. Local authorities uh, can, along with private partners, also deploy temporary uses in the public realm in order to curate the experience of streets, ranging from sort of fun activities such as events and uh, fairs and demonstrations to retail opportunities such as farmers markets uh, to works of art and performance. Uh, and more proactive English local authorities are also stepping in to pick up cheap retail assets in order to repurpose them um, to better serve local needs, for example, in Hackney in London or Bolton or Blackpool. They've all been uh, picking up uh, local retail assets and repurposing them uh, for retail, but also for, for, for public functions and so forth. 
Now, more radically still, models such as town center investment zones seek to pool ownerships uh, and responsibility in a single investment vehicle focused on sort of collectively curating entire streets, but we don't have any examples of those uh, operating yet. Together, there are a wide range of different approaches that the public sector can use to curate high streets, climbing from passive but important regulatory uh, and persuasion measures to more proactive and even to total control models. Giving up long-held regulatory powers to do this features nowhere on this ladder. So today, traditional shopping streets face an existential crisis and how we react will determine whether they have a long-term future or are doomed to inevitable decline, uh, just like popular high street. Drawing from the analysis, it's possible to conclude that governments uh, and local governments and those with management responsibilities for high streets uh, need to systematically consider their response to the four critical place-based shopping choice factors, convenience, choice, leisure, and social factors. Setting these against three proactive intervention approaches begins to answer the question, what are the key place-based factors that will help to guarantee a future for traditional high streets? Now, my own local high street, Eltham High Street in London, offers some positive lessons in this regard. Um, for example, over a few years, we've had higher density housing in, in more marginal retail locations, so replacing some of the marginal retail with higher density housing. There's been a new public realm and new public spaces um, and uh, different events and activities happening there on those spaces. And quite active curation in terms of the local authority. They've, they built this uh, cinema complex right on the high street, a cinema and restaurant complex. And before that, uh, 10 years or so ago, they built a library and leisure complex. So in doing so, uh, I think we can conclude that if we wish to avoid the sun setting further, uh, these sort of valued, uh, at least setting further on these valued uh, places and, and the rich ecologies of functions that they host, then the answer really can only be found in more and better public sector intervention, not less. And working, of course, in partnership with private actors. And we've moved beyond, I think, the old movement economy and centrality paradigm, where just to be in the right place was enough because people would come to a paradigm in which place quality is everything, to a new place attraction paradigm. Now, high streets which prior prioritise proactive intervention in order to address the place-based factors that make people actively wish to visit will survive and thrive, and those that don't I think will surely decline and die. The only thing that undermines that potential, including the extension of PDR to high streets uh, in England, is going in entirely the wrong direction. So uh, if you're interested in finding out more about these arguments um, and a longer discussion, then uh, I recently published a, a paper called The Existen Existential Crisis of Traditional Shopping Streets in the Journal of Urban Design, which you're welcome to go and download uh, free of charge. Um, thank you very much for listening to me and I'd very much be delighted if you have any questions. Thank you, thank you Matthew. Um, I will then just leave to, to our audience maybe to ask questions if they have any questions. There is someone, yeah? Okay, you can ask a question. You, you want to speak or? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Matthew. That's really interesting. Um, I, I'm, I'm a guest lecturer at Cardiff, but my, I'm in private practice in a retail planning consultancy, actually. And I've been doing that for the past 25 years. It's quite interesting working for the, dare I say it, the, the devil, uh, the big retailers and the retail parks and the developments that, um, that you've just been talking about. Um, a re really, the, the, the effect that I've seen is exactly as you, as you ex explained it there, you could see the drift from the high street through to uh, out of town shopping, first of all, and then of course the internet. And the internet is threat th seems to be threatening all physical retail, whether it's just high street and those big retail parks. So that's a, in a way, 
the high street retail parks are no longer enemies. They are both <laughs> they are both suffering as a consequence of this change. But what what has always occurred to me looking at things in the recent past is um, perhaps like it puts me into the category of fundamental change as far as policy is concerned. Because since the 1980s, um, planning policy in England um, and, and, and in Wales um, has been steadfastly directing retail development to town centres at the expense of other uses. So you, you'd uh, lose, you couldn't put um, a doctor's surgery in a prime shopping street, for example, under uh, national planning policy guidance in England or Wales at present, um, unless you really demonstrated you couldn't put a shop there. So planning, retail planning policy seems to stand in the way of the reuse of high streets now that there's a, a problems on high street. And perhaps more fundamentally is why are we protecting high streets in the first place? I'm not answering that question. I'm raising it as a question to say, well, I don't think the argument has yet been made by anybody clearly as to why we should protect our high streets um, in a manner that requires public funding or private funding. Um, there is an argument to say that retailing and the way that we move and we use space has changed. The market has, has spoken. People are doing their activities at these two town centres in other places for right or for wrong. And whether we, why should we there be banging the policy drum and saying go to town centres? And clearly, as you've outlined there, having a policy like that and then having permitted development rights would actually would actually are contrary to the policy in, in, in England in some respects, just adds to the very confused sort of policy picture, as it seems to me. So what, what do you think about policy change to sort of the, I like to call them the, you know, the, the PPG6 approach, the PPF, you know, the, now in the MPPF, but the PPG6 sort of approach of town centres first and nowhere else. What, what's your thoughts on, on that and the role of centres as far as retailing is concerned in particular? I agree with you that the, I don't see any reason why we should necessarily protect retail. Mm -hmm. But what we should protect is, is, is our high streets, because the real value of the high streets is, of course, partly retail, but it's also all of those other social and entertainment functions that go on there. They're the places that we meet as communities. They're the places that we interact. Um, and they're the places that children learn about other people and diversity and all sorts of things. And so they have real, real social value. And I think there is a lot of evidence to, to, which points to that value, including the Demos report, which I, which I, which I sort of referenced. Um, and so I think as, as, as places, they are incredibly important, but it's not about having, maximizing out on retail, which is what we've been doing for the last, well, decades. And, and it's come to a sticky end because we find that we've got far too much retail. And, um, and I think there does have to be some proper thinking and, and, and not necessarily at the level of national government, because I think locally the situation varies tremendously. But at the level of local government, it's about, you know, what are their high streets for and how are they going to change and how can they be redefined where necessary to be something different? And, and so, for example, I gave you you know, the example of my little local high street just happens to have some quite interesting interventions over the years, some of which actually not entirely on purpose. So, you know, some of the um, uh, some of the, the, the residential which has happened on the high street has actually happened in, 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 in opposition. <laughs> the, the, the council was against it, but it, it got through on appeal. Um, but nevertheless, the changes have, have, have been interesting in seeing a, a high street which has sort of been able to survive and, and weather the storm and slightly change its purpose it has still has quite a bit of retail but it has almost no for example um or very very little um uh, clothing consumer type retail a lot of it is um you know more necessities uh and food uh and a lot more services and of course phones and those sort of things uh, so that all that side of things has changed. And, and I think local authorities need to be more proactive about, you know, what is the future of these places? And yes, we can no longer say, well, retail is everything and retail is going to drive regeneration and, and all those things that we were asking for to the past, because that's just not going to happen in the future. So we need a new relationship with retail, but retail itself continues to be important and really important in people's perceptions about the quality of the place they live and what that place offers to them. Okay, well, thank you. 
it was a very, uh, I mean, I have to say, uh, our, our phone, uh, that was a very important question. I mean, the, the fact that governments at this stage are investing, continuing to investing in town centers. And, and, and this is also the case in, um, in Wales. So they also launched funding. One, uh, how much was it? Um, 15.2 million placemaking funding package. And it's focused on town centers again. Uh, when town centers have been have been always the focus and and shop and then the high streets are the ones that are really in decline so this raises really uh, interesting questions um but uh, i don't know is there someone that wants to ask questions or yeah we'll see sina yeah it's, it's not really a question it's more of a comment uh, kind of related to what arthur mentioned i mean when you think about uh, the use or role or function of city centers throughout the history it's been always changing from one time there was all the craftsmen working to one time all the factories coming in and now recently we had retails so i suppose the focus uh, from the policy perspective is not really about saving retail is more about how to use these important spaces of, um, you know, uh, living really and, and working. Uh, and the, the, the challenge is, as you say, uh, so it's more about like how we facilitate this transition, which is happening, nobody can stop it. And it's more about how to facilitate it and how to uh, facilitate this transition to, to make sure we use these spaces more efficiently and, uh, and more effectively. And uh, bringing uh, residentials or maybe even turning city center to neighborhoods, of course, that, um, that, 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 uh, that's gonna be very challenging. And also in terms of like the, the users that are not very going well with each other uh, in the, their, each other's proximity, uh, but what is obviously is, is something that the time shows. And of course the policy indicates as well. I think what we see when we look at these sorts of streets is that, you know, they are rich ecologies that, you know, somebody goes for one function, you know, you go to, I don't know, get your shoes repaired, and then you also pass a cake shop and you buy a cake. Um, and, it, you know, you, you maybe catch the bus there and, 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 and I don't know, you might, sometimes you might go and see a solicitor or something, whatever it happens to be that you, there's a group of things that you can do. And I think when we let policy or we uh, we let anything happen we that we go down the sort of darwinian route entirely then we run the risk that that rich ecology um will dissipate now you might say well that's what's happened in the past and in fact some of these places have survived and some haven't um and they've tended to change and adapt uh, fine uh, of, of you know you know, pretty much on, the, on their own without, without too much intervention. Uh, and yeah, I think there is an argument that, that, that you know, we, we can, that can happen. But what, what the situation that you get in many cities, uh, particularly somewhere like London, but I should also think somewhere like Cardiff, is that there's such a huge demand for residential that almost everything will become residential if it, you give it the chance. And that's currently the route that certainly the English government is going down. I'm not sure about the Welsh, but certainly the English government that, you know, they're, they're taking away any control on anything turning to residential. Um, and as soon as that starts to happen, it, it undermines this sort of a, this ecology of different activities and uses and, and, and lower value activities, particularly manufacturing. There's a, there's a lot of small scale manufacturing that goes on on our traditional high streets and behind in that hinterland behind this shopping frontage, which is really, really critical uh, and lots of jobs and so forth associated with it. Um, so I think there is an element of protection required, but at the same time, we can't stand against change. Change is going to happen and we need to, we need to encourage it, but we've got to be careful. And it's, it's, about, it's about having an intelligent approach, an intelligent approach to intervention um, at the same time as allowing change. Uh, just picking up on that point, you've about intelligent change. One of the things that always strikes me when looking at policies uh, is that city centres, town centres, your local parade, your district centres, your modern shopping centres are all treated in a blanket approach. 
And while your local high street, like for, like for us locally, you know, Cowbridge High Street has got all the nice shops on it that you can walk along, you can do, go to a green grocery, you can go to a hardware store, you can do all that sort of thing. The very um, uh, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of picture postcard kind of high street approach. We've also got a lot of centers that really don't follow any traditional model, and yet they still fulfill that important retail and social function. And equally, we have city centers like Cardiff, for example, if you're disabled, and you want to go shopping in the center of Cardiff, and the same as you would if you're going to go in the center of London or any other big city, it's actually really difficult to get in there. They're, they're, the public transport modes aren't there anymore. The nodes have moved out to the to the burbs. The car parking is really expensive. It's not made, made particularly accessible because it's pedestrianized. So it makes it difficult for people to get to the door. So it does seem to lend itself to an approach that is different for different types of centers and a very much more intelligent approach than the blanket approach that um, we've, we seem to have adopted to date. Um, what, what, what's your thoughts on that? No, I absolutely agree. And I think, you know, the, when we let national governments make too much of the running on, the, on this sort of thing, then we get into difficulty because national governments, by their, by their nature, they want solutions, but they don't necessarily understand the local um, diversity and, 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 and implications. Um, so this is why we need to empower local governments, I think, uh, in this front. But also working with you know private partners. I'm not, so I'm not suggesting that local governments have all the answers here. They need to work with people like yourself and 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 and, and the industry who who really have a sort of uh, a, an in depth knowledge, uh, in depth knowledge of, of of how these things work and and how change could happen. Um. I would like just to ask a question on on this issue of, I mean, the, the local governments, of course, are the ones that will have to steer this. And 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 uh, and um, we all know, and also it was, was also an outcome of, of your uh, design skills <laughs> uh, report. They are, I mean, they are not just under-resourced, but they are under-skilled. Uh, so they don't have, they are not equipped for all these challenges, you know, and uh, this is even more acute in, in Wales, where we just have two local authorities that have urban designers, for instance, you know, uh, in the in the in the teams. So um, I just wanted to know, I mean, are you planning with your work? Uh, is it through your place alliance uh, to create like a movement to, let's say, to shake these things and to make sure that uh, the national governments give more funding to local authorities. I, I mean, I just wanted to know, I mean, you have been, because you have a reputation, you have this, you know, uh, and you have the credibility and you have worked with national governments before. Um, I just wanted to know because it's, I think it's important. Yeah, I have a reputation <laughs> for complaining. Probably. Complaining, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, well, the Place Alliance, what the Place Alliance tries to do is it tries through evidence, tries to, to, to gather evidence and tries to put that in front of government and say, right, well, you know, here's the problem. And this is what you need to address. And particularly, you know, in relation to design and the quality of the built environment, that's really what the Place Alliance is all about. But it does, it tries to do it through evidence. And so recently we published a report called the Design Deficit that looked across England and the Place Alliance is only, and it only covers England. And it looked at you know, the, the deficit in terms of design skills in local authorities. And where you have that deficit, it is a real, real problem to deal proactively, I think, with complex physical environments like our local high streets. Um, because the tendency is just to understand them in policy, trying to understand them in policy terms and not to, not to try and understand them physically and what they are as real places and that people interact with and engage with. And so I think you do need to have those people. And it's not just urban designers, it's people who can engage with communities. It's people who have a knowledge about the you know, property industry and so forth and can engage with developers and, and so forth. And we really, really, really do need to invest in our local authorities in getting those, getting those skills deficits reversed. And until we do, I fear that some of these really wicked problems are going to be beyond many places. As far as, the, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, I mean, we, we carry on pegging away. We carry on saying that, you know, this is the problem. Uh, if anybody's listening to us, I don't know, but um, we shall see. 
Yeah, that's that's an important question. Where does they listen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have uh, someone, uh, Francesca wants to ask a question. Hello. Yes, I'll be quick because it's half term and I've got all sorts of noises behind me. Matthew, thank you very much. And I've got to say, you know, among all the things Patricia said at the beginning, I'm always surprised every time I hear you how good you are at actually grabbing a really complex topic and cutting it straight to the middle and unpacking all the bits and making everything a, a lot clearer in terms of dynamics and ways forward. So my question is, um, is there a role for community? And if there is, what, what do you think it is? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think communities have to be central in all of this because ultimately it's about communities. I mean, you know, coming back to the early question about why should we even worry about high streets or town centres? Well, we worry about them because they are the places that, that, that they're sort of the heart of our communities very often, whether it's a very local little high street or, or, or a bigger town or city centre, they are the heart of our communities. So communities have to be act actively engaged with them, I think. Um, and different places will do that um, better and some not so well. Um, many not at all. My little local high street that I was talking about here, Elton, there's, there's really no function, there's no way that the community can get involved with that at all. And some good things have happened irrespective of that, but nevertheless, uh, you know, I think even better things would have happened if the community had been engaged because, you know, not least, I think communities want to understand what these dynamics are, why their high streets are changing and, um, you know, how they can play a part in, 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 in helping to support them and, and, and um, maintain what they value about them or trying to encourage their local authorities to invest in, in new things like, um, like for example on our high street there's, there's this new cinema which has been open for a couple of years it's fantastic you know people actually go onto the high street to go to the cinema at least they do now they didn't during the pandemic but um to go on the, and then they they might pop into a restaurant and they might pop into a shop and 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 so it's it's you know something like that was a quite a big investment for the local authority to make, but they did it. Um, and they, you know, hopefully they'll get a long, they'll get a return over the long term. Uh, now, of course, they're elected and they're elected by the community, arguably. Um, but it would be nice, I think, to have a more, uh, a more obvious mechanism in many places for the community to really engage with uh, their high streets, I think. I don't know whether you know any good examples of places that do it. Um, there are a couple in Wales, um, but yeah, maybe that for a, a separate conversation. <laughs> I don't know. On on, uh, I think my my question is yes, a space for community builds to lead, to follow, to come in at certain points. I think where we are in Wales, those are the questions that we're looking at at the moment. Yeah, but I think it has to be a bit of all of the above, doesn't it? Because they have to. You know, communities are not always, they don't necessarily have the skills and the knowledge themselves. They might have a sense of what it's like to live in a place and what they might like to see, but they don't necessarily have the professional expertise um, to know how to go from here to there. And so I think there, there, is, there is some leadership at the community level because they, in a way, have to say, right, well, we want better. <laughs> we want more, we want better. But at the same time, there needs to be leadership from the local government because um, they are the organisation that potentially has the greatest overall responsibility for these spaces. And also they represent those communities. And so it, there's a balance, I think, between those different functions. And some communities will be more capable of, of offering leadership than others. Just a quick comment, actually. Um... Uh, Power to Change, the charity, has recently published a report on uh, saving High Street, uh, the community takeover, uh, where they really focus on uh, community businesses and how you can initiate them and how you can fund and support them uh, to, to take over High Street and have businesses. Yeah. And I think There's, examples where that happens can be really positive. There is uh, someone who wants to ask a question, Shan? Shan? Shan, Shan. Hi, I'm um, Master from Cardiff Uni. So back in 2019, I attended a workshop with UCLDPU uh, like about saving and studying seven system market in Tottenham, London. 
and it's a, like a Latin American market is going to be changing to affordable housing regeneration program. And one of the biggest problems I feel like is that the value of this kind of retail market and is really difficult and it's intangible to, to measure. And also the the retail owner, they actually are renting from a bigger developing company. They're renting from Granger and they like not in a way their like rights are not very protected. And like the local people, even the government are leading more tend to, to transfer this place, to destroy that place because they have they had like a semi-serious drug and violence problem. So my question is like, how is this type of retail market? Because apparently not all the retail market are fancy and it's very enjoyable. That is like a local hub for the Latin American community, but it doesn't mean it's for everyone of, of us. So how is the value of this type of retail shops, the market and are measured can be protected? Like how government can like, you know, intervene and to do something about about this type of situation where most of people don't really see the value of it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, it oh, you know, there are many, many different types of street markets um, from you know, very informal local ones to huge street markets and, you know, serving different cultural groups and, and uh, socioeconomic groups, and they all take on very different characteristics. In general, they have huge social value. Um, there's, lot, the, 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 there's quite a lot of research looking at the value of markets um uh the, the social and economic value of markets to lo to local communities which shows that they have huge value and you can measure it scientifically you know you can you can you can look at uh you know the spend in markets and and and, and so forth you can look at the jobs created you can look at there's different ways that you can look at it but fundamentally, you know, if we want to measure it, we need to ask people about what is what is it they value about these places, you know, and, and sometimes it's just their places that they would go to to meet their friends or to see a friendly face or um, they might be that, you know, some products are very cheap and therefore, you know, uh, if you're on a low income, then it's a really good place to go. Um, other people, you know, there's lots of markets which are more higher end markets and they're, 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 it's all about the leisure experience, you know. Um, so it's difficult to say that, you know, there should be one approach for all markets, except to say that almost always they are very, very positive things. Well, another experience that I got is like, those developers, they tend to provide more like a better vision and supporting figures to the government to say like, if we have affordable housing, which is actually not really affordable and that will be better. And, you know, in this kind of circumstance, like the measure of the, like, you know, the job opportunity, the vibrant of the, for the community is just like, is very, I'm persuade, persuaded for the local government. And that's part of the reason I feel like that we didn't, well, they didn't really get to save this market. Yeah, I, well, that's right. I mean, when somebody comes along and says, I'm gonna build you this many new homes and this many new affordable homes, it's, it's, it's a case, you know, there needs to be a balance. Somebody needs to, you know, look at the balance and, and, and decide, you know, what is most positive. I would say in almost all cases, uh, you can you can still keep a street market and have new development in many places. And, um, you know, there's absolutely no, if there's a viable street market, there's absolutely no excuse to get rid of it as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> um, because they are so important. Yeah, yeah, I think that's my question, yeah. I was just wondering whether there was someone. Uh, okay, I, I'm conscious about the time. Um, I think probably we'll have to um, uh, end the session. Um, just wanted to say thank you to Matthew. Uh, it was really a fantastic <laughs> session. Uh, you really um, 
I mean, the choice of topic was actually fantastic, although in the beginning I asked you to talk about your new project, Herman Maestro, but I think it's this is a very relevant topic to discuss, and, and uh, that's why we had such a great audience, because it's something that um, a lot of us are now um, trying to find answers, and it, you discuss it in a very simple and uh, straightforward way, which... which, which it's 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 easy to 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 let's say to it and it's more accessible for for a wider audience and 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 I would like to thank you for that. It's, it's like like always, you, your lectures are brilliant. Um, thank you. And so yeah, uh, I hope to see you again soon. Hopefully next time in our seminars, you will come to Cardiff and you will have lunch with us, <laughs> like <laughs> like before, like in normal times. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you everyone for your questions and for listening. Okay, thank, thank you very much. And see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.